So I'd like you all to welcome Kyle to the stage to talk about the shape of conversations. Welcome, Kyle. Can everyone hear me? No? Yes, there we go. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. I work at a, um, I suppose you call it an innovation lab, R&D hub, something like that, for TNS. I have a data science team under me. An area of interest of mine has always been network theory, when I say always, the last few years. And what I'm going to share with you today is some of the insights that we've come across through mapping conversations on social media. I'm going to focus on Twitter today because we just don't have time for anything else. But in mapping these conversations over and over and over and over and over again, we've discovered that there are kind of some patterns that emerge time and time again when we talk about brands. So, oh, uh, this is not the new comment, this is the old presentation. Anyway, let me carry on. If you can switch in the background, if that's possible. Um, so what we found is that conversations around brands tend to sit in a continuum from highly centralized to decentralized. And um, what we do is we'll, 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 we'll connect people whenever they, mean, they interact or talk with each other. So if I at mention you or retweet you, in some way interact with you, we connect those people up and eventually we get a map of the whole conversation that's happened around a brand or category or campaign, whatever the case may be. And I'm going to give you three examples today of different brands along this continuum. Starting with uh, what I call the hub and spoke pattern, where you have this highly centralized pattern of a brand account in the middle and people interacting with it on other sides. This is, in many cases, a, um, an analog to more traditional communication strategies where brands broadcasting out and people just retweeting it on. Or it's a support account and people just talking into it because they have problems with their, their product or whatever the case may be. It's highly centralized around one kind of anchor account. As you get a bit more decentralized, you get these kind of spin-off communities. Oh, excuse me. And um, yeah, you still have a single account that's kind of like anchoring the community. But you also have these conversations between individuals that are little side conversations that spin off the main conversation. And then on the far side, you have these very decentralized, organic, almost ecosystems, where if this is an entire footprint for a brand, or tweets talking about the brand, for example, you actually have multiple accounts anchoring that conversation, that footprint, and you'll often have somewhat distinct and overlapping communities of different constituencies and agendas. We often see this in brands that have enthusiast communities like Disney or, or Intel, who might have a community around the Internet of Things, around gaming, big data, different aspects. So that's the kind of continuum we're going to be talking about. So let's have a look at some examples. So this is um, Budweiser. Um, this is the best, the what's it, the best buds, the lost puppy advert from the Super Bowl. I'm sure most most people have seen it. Normally, when you see this highly centralized shape, it's because brands are just broadcasting out and people just retweeting and passing it on very passively. This is an interesting case, though, where that wasn't the reason why we got a highly centralized pattern. But before I go into that, I just want to remind everyone of the ad. When I wake up, well I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. And when I go out, yeah I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you. <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look what this ad looked like, the conversation around the ad looked like on Twitter. This is uh, an excerpt of that conversation around this ad and the brand, around, in, the, in the context of the Super Bowl.
that's the final footprint. So as you can see, it's very, very centralized around the main bud account up there. In fact, I've got a pointer. Um, and most of what's happening here, these kind of satins rings of people just retweeting the ad, sharing it on. There are a few occasions where some other influential accounts have shared it, but you can see similar satin rings around them, implying that those people's followers just passed it on passively as well. It's a really, really unique footprint that I haven't seen before for such a large and very popular piece of content to be so centralized. So why did it create such a centralized pattern? Well, these are the kind of things people are saying about it. So many emotions just felt in one minute. Heartbreakingly cute. Made me cry for the third time. Are they trying to sell me beer? Or what, are they trying to make me cry or sell me beer? And when we measured this with our comms model, what we found is that this ad super over-indexed on the first two of our three dimensions in terms of what creates brand memories. It was very novel, it captured people's attention. It had a high affect, which loosely relates to emotion. So it created a lot of emotion. Really, really did well on those ones. But on our third dimension of relevance, it really fell down far lower than, than, than most we'd expect. And I think that's what we're seeing here, is that people share it because they want to share the emotion with their friends, but they don't speak about it amongst each other because it's not necessarily that relevant. So that's a very centralized footprint. Let's have a look at a spin-off conversation. This is Burger King when it was launched in South Africa last year. At the time, they had queues running around the block. Let's have a look at the pattern. Take note of the conversations coming off to the side. I think I need to speed, my, speed up a bit. But that's what they end up, the, the final conversation footprint looked like, where you had a lot more conversations happening on the side. And to give you an idea, this conversation over here was between Burger King and Nando's, which is a peri-peri chicken, which is a kind of Portuguese chili chicken place. And what kind of created that side conversation was this bit of com, you know, smack talk between brands. Saying, shame, Burger King, we hear your burgers only come in mild. To spice things up, try our peri peri chicken. To which Burger King responded, we're not chicken when it comes to friendly competition, but it's hard to ignore that today we're the ones spicing up Johannesburg. So what created those conversations was interactions that humanized the brand. Interactions that people felt the need to talk about and to share. Rather than retweet to win, re you know, buy one, get one three free if you retweet this, that kind of... Um, very, very surface level interaction. Okay, last example. So what does a very decentralized conversation look like? This is Lego at the Oscars where they were promoting the new movie. Even before the Oscars, Lego had somewhat of an ecosystem around the brand that a few enthusiast communities, a few influencers that were related to the brand. One of the most prominent of which is Nathan Soyan, who is an artist who makes all of his art out of Lego. And they got him to present the winners with Lego statuettes. So let's have a look at this conversation and take note of how decentralized it is. Very different picture, right? So, yeah, we have Lego, I mean, yeah, Lego's official account. We have Nathan Sawyer and a separate community. We have the Oscars and Academy's community. We have different media houses that were picking up on the 
activation or campaign who, you know, everyone loves Lego, right? Everyone's grown up with Lego, and it was very novel. So a very, very different picture. They brought in a few accounts into the, into the, uh, the event before the time. They had existing communities in place, influencers that they were able to tap into, and it resulted in a very different picture. Okay, so let's summarize what we've just discussed. The question I think that comes up first for everyone is, well, should I be a very centralized or decentralized brand, or if I'm a centralized, if I have a centralized pattern of communication, is that something I need to move away from? Um, centralized patterns of communication are definitely a bit more old school. It's a bit more about broadcasting and not necessarily engaging in a, in a, you know, a human way. But it is a balance. I think you probably want to sit somewhere in the middle of here, maybe over there. And um, there, there's benefits to both sides of the equation. So for example, centralizing the conversation allows you to control the conversation. But that often leads to sometimes a bit of a boring conversation. Having that one directional broadcasting approach is probably useful in a maintenance strategy. It is useful for updating existing brand associations. But can they really affect perceptions? If I'm trying to change the category debate, ch trying to change conversations about my brand, is the impact I'm going to have through the passive reclicking of, you know, low involvement reclicking of a retweeting of a, of a tweet or um, sharing of a Facebook post, the same as getting people to engage on uh, or about my brand. And what's nice about having a more decentralized footprint for your brand is that it creates sustained engagement. By the nature of being decentralized, it means that there are multiple constituencies involved, often enthusiast constituencies who are there talking about the brand because they love it, or the category, or whatever the case may be. But you can have the scenario where it can actually be very difficult to lead that conversation, or in worst case scenario where that conversation can actually run away with you, away right from you, and you lose control of it totally. And we see that in terms of PR nightmares all the time. So it is a balance. It's not one or the other. But what we've seen the best brands do is create a social ecosystem where they obviously have their brand accounts. Sometimes they have accounts with specific campaigns for variant brands, sub-brands, um, charities, causes. They, they create a whole ecosystem of accounts. And then very importantly, they, they knit them together. So they tap into their enthusiast communities. Um, for example, when we were looking at ice cream conversations in the US, they were very, very disjointed. There wasn't really an overall category conversation. But the one group that was talking in a kind of more joined up, connected way, in a consistent way, were food porn enthusiasts who share photos of decadent food. So maybe what a band would want to do is they want to feed, give them fodder, you know, feed them pictures of great food porn relating to your brand. And you also want to copy in your spokespeople. And what you're doing is you're exposing your brand to multiple different constituencies and you're knitting together this ecosystem. A good example of that is Doritos in the Super Bowl. Um, excuse me. They did a couple of things. They, before the campaign, they um, actually had a competition. You could direct the Doritos video or ad, and then you could um, win. Uh, I don't actually know what the prize was. But going to the Super Bowl, they had two competing ads that had been created by consumers, and it turned out that each of these consumers had built up substantial followings, and they were very separate groups. So if you look at the footprint for Doritos, it actually has multiple accounts anchoring, talking about this ad that came out of those guys who were competing to win. But what they also had was Tony Hawk, who, the skater, who'd been a previous spokesperson for the brand. Unbeknownst to them, he just picked up on the ad, shared it, and it had really resonated with him, his group of people, his community, his constituency. So Doritos while having done a great job at seeding the community beforehand, they hadn't necessarily tapped into Tony Hawk, so they could have done an even better job at meet, reaching multiple people, multiple communities, knitting things together into an ecosystem. And the way you do that's pretty simple. You're obviously talking to people, you're mentioning them, maybe you're dot at mentioning so that, so that all their followers see it. Obviously, if you're doing this though, you're having to share really uh, authentic content, otherwise you just piss people off. And to a lesser extent, you're using hashtags that allow people to find the conversation. Um, we, we've seen examples where clients have had activations and campaigns where they've got people that they've sponsored and they said, use our brand hashtag. And that, per, that person's you know, famous footballer or musician or actor does that. 
all their followers retweet and they disappear. No conversation started. And then you see other, other clients who, before the campaign starts, they um, make sure that every tweet goes to everyone involved in the campaign, every spokesperson, every sponsoree, every sponsoree posted, cross-posted, and you get this whole ricocheting effect going off, and all these different communities get uh, drawn into the conversation and exposed in that way. And then finally, you obviously need to start real conversations. We're not in a world of one-directional broadcasting, although that can have its place too, where you just want people to bounce your content on from one person to the next in an unbroken chain. Rather, what, rather I would argue, is what you're trying to do is create a two-way conversation, get real engagement. And what we've seen, uh, or what we're starting to see, and just have tantalizing glimpse at, so, glimpses of so far, is that if you look at any model of virality, they'll tell you that valence is important for sharing. Is it positive, is it negative? That kind of emotion, that kind of emotive content is important for going viral. But there's, there's multiple ways of going viral, as we've shown. You can get that kind of one-directional broadcasting, or you can get that very decentralized conversation going. And I think that emotion is great, but ensuring that your content is relevant, authentic, is even better. Thanks. Thanks, Carl. Now we do have time for maybe just one quick question. Anyone got a question for Carl? We've got a shy audience. Okay, I actually have one if that's okay. Yeah. Just a really quick one. How does the brand's social footprint relate back to traditional research, traditional survey research? So, so far the, the world of social and survey have been very separate yep. things. But we've been doing some research into where the links lie and that's people at this table have done quite a bit of it. Um, the kind of things we're seeing is that unprompted mentions of brands on social media are kind of like unprompted mentions of brands in surveys. We're seeing good links between those kind of things. When people are talking um, about your brand in, in an unprompted manner, um, the correlations between that and things like unprompted first mention awareness, um, top mind, yeah, the same thing most often, those kind of things. We're seeing quite good links there. So there's a lot more search, uh, research needs to be done in that area, but it isn't the case that these are really separate magisteria. There, there seems to be quite uh, some overlap. Excellent. Again, thank you. Clap Carl now. Thanks.